Do you, well, I'll go over. I'll go over that in a little bit. Let's let's just start going through the outline. So, the way that this outline works, obviously, nothing is is just set in stone. You have to do things this way when you when you preach the gospel to somebody. Okay, this is this is the method that I use. This is the system. The 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 steps that I always go through. I think they're all very important. That's why they're on the list. Um, if you do things out of order, it's not the end of the world. If you do, you know, whatever. So don't like, well, I don't want this to be, I don't want people getting nervous or like freaking out if you're trying to give the gospel to someone and you're like, you know, too focused on, on you know, on, on doing like every exact step along the way. Um, the most important thing is is preaching the gospel. I mean, that's, you know, using the Bible verse. And I'll, and I'll mention that first, um, number one. On the very back, I've got tips, okay? And the very, I'll go over the rest of the tips later, but number one, always use Bible verses. Always. So if you're going to preach the gospel to someone, you know, the new evangelicals are, are kind of, real loose with the way they present the gospel and preach the gospel they think like a lot of people think that just explaining that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and rose again just just kind of given your your own understanding or explanation of that is enough for people to get saved and it's not because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God so what what I want everyone to take away is the more Bible you can use the better God's word is what's powerful. God's word is the sword. God's word is, is, is really what is going to be piercing through the heart of the unsaved person for them to, to get saved. So using the Bible is the most important thing. Now you'll notice on the basic outline, most of the steps, all I have on here are verses. Because when you preach the gospel, you will be explaining these verses to people as you, you know, right after you read them. That is what is entailed in preaching the gospel. Otherwise, we would just hand them a Bible or hand them a tract and, and they could just read stuff. And I, again, I don't think people get saved by even just by reading. I think somebody needs, you know, we have been committed the, the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says we're ambassadors for Christ. We were commanded to go out and preach the gospel, not write it down and hand it out, but to preach it. And it's very important. So the preaching part comes in when you do the speaking God's word and then explaining what they mean. It's a, the exact, a great example of this is found in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip was, um, you know, this guy was reading the Bible. The eunuch was reading the Bible. He's in his chariot and he's just, he's reading God's word. And he's not understanding it at all because he's not saved. And um, Philip goes up and he asks him, he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he's like, how can I accept some man should guide me? And that's a basic truth with people who are unsaved. They can't understand. They don't have the spirit of God. They, they can't really completely grasp and understand the fullness and truth in God's word. So we are required, God has designed it this way for us to go out and to explain it to people and, and to show them how to be saved. So... Um, at any time, if you have a question, feel free. This isn't church, so go ahead, men, women, raise your hand and ask any questions along the way. Something's not making sense or whatever. Just feel free to stop me. And, and this, is, this is for your benefit to try to, to understand the most and to learn about um, just giving the gospel to people. So the first thing I start with is the conversation starter. Now, this can be at the door. This can be a, a relative, a friend. This, this, the great thing about this outline is it works for all situations. I mean, you can be at a party and talking to someone. You can be at a gas station filling up your, your gas pump. You know, however you get involved in a conversation, whether it's because you're knocking on someone's door or you're just involved in a conversation, it's gonna, this will work and this will help you because one of the things I think a lot of people have a problem with is how do you start talking about the gospel? Like, just be like, hey, are you saved? You know, just like you're, you're having a conversation, it's a birthday party, and, and you know what? That's not a bad idea. And I'm not gonna make fun of anyone for doing that or at all, or, or mock that. But people just, you know, it's kind of like, 
you don't want to just be completely random out of the blue, right? I mean, it, it just might be a little awkward for yourself to, to try to do that. So one good thing that, that you could easily lead into is if you start talking about your church. Because people talk about things that you do, right? I mean, when you kind of have a conversation with anybody just in the world in general, there are a few things you talk about. One thing you talk about is the weather, right? Oh, it's really nice out today. Oh, it, or uh, how are you doing? Yeah. People ask that all the time. And you see people, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, you know, what have you been up to? Well, I really love my church. I'm going to this church and we do this activity and we do this and we do that. Do you go to church anywhere? It's as soon as you get on that subject of church, you're in. As soon as you get on that subject, if you could get on that subject, it's really easy to do. Because then it's just a matter of saying, okay, yeah, I go to this church. Well, where do you go to church? Now you're starting to ask them about religious things, about, about church, about what they believe. And then, no matter what their answer is, I mean, they could say, I don't go to church. They can say, um, you know, I'm Catholic. They can say, I'm Baptist. They could say, whatever. It, do, it, it really doesn't matter. Now, their answer can give you a little bit of an insight about what they believe. You know, if they say, yeah, I don't, I don't go to church. You know, maybe they don't have much of a belief at all. But, um, and that can only help you a little bit later as you're trying to give them the gospel. Now, well, Sarah, why don't you go play with the girls? Go play with your sisters? Mom. The, the thing that I almost always say then is when you get on the subject of church, you say, well, more important than going to church or more important than what church you go to, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Or do you know for sure if you're saved? This is the number one question to get you into the gospel. Is everyone clear on getting into the gospel? Because once we get started now... Um, there's a few different ways that people can answer that if they know for sure they're going to heaven, right? And they can say, yeah, I'm going. And I always ask, why? Well, what, how do you know? Like, what do you believe? What, what do you believe it takes for a person to be saved? What do you, what do you believe it takes for a person to go to heaven? And, um, you know, this, and this is where you start to, to, to ask a person to, to find out if they are saved. Because if they're not, which... Most of the time they won't be. I mean, most people aren't saved. Or if you already know they're not saved, um, just be like, well, can I show you how, what I believe, it, you know, what I believe about being saved? Like sometimes someone might say, well, yeah, I'm a really good person. And I'll say, you know what? Well, do you believe the Bible? Because most people do. You say, yeah, well, yeah, I believe the Bible. You know, did you know that the Bible says that it's, it's actually not based on how good we are? Can I just show you a few verses that explain that? And that's a good way to get into you know, a conversation with somebody. And you obviously want to be um, gentle with people, like just in general, especially when you're just getting started in a conversation. You, you don't want to like just, oh man, you're going to hell, my friend. You know, just, just, just like based off of their first answer, do you go to church anywhere? No. You want to engage them in conversation so that they're, they're willing to talk, obviously. Um, so, once you get someone to the point where they're, they're willing to listen to you give the gospel, the first thing that you show them is that they're a sinner. So I have all these different Bible verses. And again, you can use whatever Bible verses you want. It's not, this is not the only way to give the gospel. Um, whatever makes sense to you, the, uh, the, the verses that you understand the most, the verses that just kind of click in your mind that make the most sense, those are the ones that you should use. Okay? So the first thing that people need to understand is that they are a sinner. Because what we're doing is we're explaining that they need a Savior. If they don't think they need a Savior, then why would they get saved? And the first step is showing them they're a sinner. So Romans 3.23 is the one I personally use all the time for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. So I'll go to that Bible verse and explain and say, hey, this verse real simply is saying that everybody's sin. Do you agree with that statement? I mean... 99.9% .9 of the people will agree with that statement and say, yes, you know, I, I know I'm a sinner. The other one you could use is also in Romans chapter 3, verse number 10. 
And again, there's others that you can use. These are both real easy to go to. Um, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's funny, look, none of us is perfect. We've all sinned. We've all done wrong. We've all broken God's commandments. Now, after they admit they're a sinner, then you could go and show them, well, did you know that there's a punishment for our sins? That just because everybody's a sinner doesn't make it okay. There's a problem with that. And I'll show them like Romans 6.23 next, where the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. And I don't, I don't typically read the entire verse. I mean, again, you can do it if you want. It's not a big deal. But um, we're focused on the, the bad part first. So we, we start off just with the bad news to get them to understand they're a sinner and that there is a punishment. Now, after you show them that the wages, you know, explain what wages mean. There's a few words, especially the, the ones that might seem to be a little bit more difficult. Um, when you talk to people, you, I, you never try to assume that they understand what the words mean. So like, I talk to people, you know, talk to, to younger people or even older people sometimes or, or, or people whose um, first language is in English. They might not understand what wages are. So this is part of also where the preaching comes in. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. And I'll ask someone, well, do you know what a wage is? Do you know what wages are? And I'll explain, you know, minimum wage and that it's basically you're just receiving a payment for something you've done. For work that you've done, you receive a payment. That's what wages are. So the result of our sin, what we get paid is death. And um, then I'll explain that, you know, after we die, that's not the end of it. We, we're all physically going to die one day. But after we die, there's, there's, the Bible talks about a second death. And then I flip over to Revelation 20, where we see here, Revelation 20 and 21. Tw Revelation 20, 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So we show them here, I'm showing them that, that death and hell being cast into the lake of fire, that's the second death. This is the one we have to be worried about. We don't have to be worried about our first death. This is the second death is what we want to make sure we're not a part of. It says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then I flip over to Re Revelation 21.8 because I'll often tend to ask then too, what do you think a person would have to do in order to go to hell? And another tip, okay, this is another tip that I have. Verse number, or tip number three on the back. Keep this in mind also. You're trying to engage in conversation with somebody. You're not just preaching at them. So like right now, I'm, I'm preaching at you. No, no, no one's giving me like feedback. We're not having a conversation. I'm just doing all the talking right now and you're listening. But when you're, at the, when you're, when you're preaching the gospel to someone, it's really important to make sure that their mind isn't just drifting off, thinking about other things, just distracted about something, and totally miss what you're trying to say. So in order to do that with people, and look, this happens to everybody. It happens at church. It happens. I don't care where you're at, if you're at school, if you're listening to your teacher, even if you're interested in what's going on, we all from time to time will just start to space out and start to think about other things and then, oh, wait, and, and, and get back and pay attention or, or, you know, whatever. But when you're having a conversation with somebody, if you're actually both engaged and it's not just one person doing all the talking, you're a lot less likely to have someone just be completely distracted with you. They'll be, you know, and, and, and make sure if someone is distracted. I mean, if, they're, if there's kids around and animals, there's all kinds of craziness going on, really try to focus on, on keeping the conversation going by asking questions. Even if it's just, do you agree with that? Do you believe that? Do you see what the Bible's saying here? And at this point in step number three, with showing the punishment for sin and that, and that they, so the specific person that you're talking to deserves that punishment of hell, I'll ask the question to get them involved. Well, what do you think would send someone to hell? I'll ask like, well, do you believe hell's a real place? Do you, I mean, do you believe heaven's a real place? Most people say they do. Some people don't. If they don't believe in hell, I try to prove that from the Bible and show them why, I mean, hell's real. This is something we need to, we need to fear and, and, and know that it's a real place and God's judgment is here. But then the other thing is because most people, even if they do believe in hell, they think that they're not going to hell. They think, I'm not that bad, right? I've never killed anybody. I mean, come on. I've never, maybe I've never even stolen before. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. 
I treat animals well. I, you know, I say hi to everybody. I'm a good guy. I'm a good girl. But in God's eyes, none of us are. And that's what we're trying to, to express and get across at this point in preaching the gospel is that no matter how good you think you are, you still deserve the punishment of hell. That is what you deserve. And Roman, or excuse me, Romans, Revelation 21, 8, well, you can show that to them. Because Revelation 20, we already showed them, hey, the lake of fire, it's a real place. This is the second death, right? But who goes there? Revelation 21, 8 lists all these different sins. And there's a few that you could choose from that we've all been. Like the very first one, but the fearful. Have you ever been fearful? I've been fearful. The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. So, lists up all these different things, but I always focus on the liars part because we know we've all lied. We've all told lies before. And a lot of people will say, well, I mean, do you think telling a lie is bad enough to go to hell? And a lot of people say, no, of course not. I mean, because they've lied. But then, well, what, but what does the Bible say? So if it says all liars, how many, and I'll, exp I'll have a tendency to explain this as well. I'll ask them, well, how many people, if, if this is kind of a sticking point for them, you could say, well, how many people do you have to kill before you're labeled a murderer? Right? Well, just one. You only have to kill one person before you're murdered. Is it a hundred? Do I have to kill a hundred people and now all of a sudden I could be called a murderer? No, you kill one person. Well, because... It, it, it's this concept of being called a liar, right? People have a tendency to think, well, I'm not a liar because they're not like a habitual liar that just lies all the time. But that's not what this is saying or means. You can tell one lie and now you can be called a liar because you've told a lie. The same way if you kill somebody, you've called a murderer. And, um, you know, I, I'll have a tendency to explain that if, if, if it's a real big hang-up. But by this point now... We're trying to make sure people understand, okay, in God's, and I'll explain that too. Like, look, in man's eyes, you may be a really great person. I don't doubt that, that you help people out. And I'm sure you've never done like these real horrible things. But according to God, in God's eyes, you are still a sinner and his punishment for your sins is hell. This is what the Bible says. And, you know, it's up to us to either believe that or not. If you claim to believe God's word, if you claim to believe the Bible, then you have to believe what this is saying here, that we deserve this punishment, which is exactly why we need a savior. And I'll say, look, this is the bad news. But the good news is that God still loves us. It's not like he wants us all to go to hell, even though that's what we deserve. Even though by breaking his rules, we deserve hell. He still doesn't want us to go to that place. He loves us. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ to come and pay for our sins. So now we're on step four and I'll show them, you know, we're, this is the point where we're getting to the good news. We had to explain the bad news because without the bad news, what, what, what do you even need the good news for? The bad news is there for a reason. But the good news is what we want to spend probably the most time on because this is where the gospel lies is in the good news. Bad news is important. It needs to be understood. But the good news is even more important um, for people to, to, to get saved. Uh, Romans 5.8, the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I show him that even though, even though we're sinners, even though we've done wrong, even though we deserve this punishment of hell, God still loves us and he loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to die for us. Now, this is a point where I like to spend quite a bit of time explaining who Jesus Christ was. Now, there's verses for all of these, but typically in America, it, where, the places where we go soul winning, most people have heard about Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he did for us. So this doesn't typically require, doesn't normally require a lot of, you know, proving from the Bible verses, right? Because, but, it's a, but these are all important points to just go over in your head is like, well, 
You know, the Bible explain, you know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Right? Do you believe that? You know, Jesus was God. He did everything good. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. You know, you and I are sinners. Jesus was perfect. He did a lot of miracles. He proved he was the Son of God. He proved, proved he was the Christ. But people hated him. They rejected him. They whipped him and beat him up and nailed him to the cross. And he died on that cross and rose again after three days. Came back to life. And just go over that with people. And if anyone has a problem with any of those things that, that I kind of bring up, because that's where the gospel lies, is, is, in, is in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and then resurrection again. We need to believe that to be saved. And that's why I have 1 Corinthians 15 on here, which is also another good verse to show people. Verse number 3 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament that a Savior was going to come, a Lamb was going to come, and his blood was going to be shed. He was going to be put to death and rise again after three days of being dead. And Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. And, and, and you know, in so doing, paid the entire punishment for our sins. Now, um, if that works, the next step I'll go to is then, okay, well, Jesus died for us, but what do we have to do to be saved? Would you mind answering this? It's, uh, it's Wayne. You're going to have to answer and then press 1 to receive the call. So I explain, okay, Jesus did his part. Now, the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross, that he bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. And it says that, um, you know, he died for everybody. But what do we have to do to be saved? Because obviously not everyone's going to heaven. Just because Jesus died on the cross for everyone doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. So now it's the, the important part. Well, what do we have to do? And I'll ask someone, like, what do we have to do? But by this point, uh, you know, I'm kind of more showing them. Make sure you got them engaged in the conversation. But um, you might ask them and say, well, what do you think we have to do to be saved? And then whatever their answer is, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people at this point still don't understand it's a free gift. Um, be like, well, I'll show you. You know, there's a man that actually asks this very question in the Bible. What do I have to do to be saved? And turn to Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. Um, key verse says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And you can ask them, see, be like, see, what does the Bible say? And, I, and I'll ask them again, this is keeping them engaged. What does that say you have to do to be saved? Because sometimes when people aren't really paying attention, they'll say, well, you've got to be a good person. <laughs> and, and, and this happens quite a bit. Sebastian knows this. We go out. I mean, people will say that. It's like you just got done reading the verse and they'll say, well, you've got to be good. You've got to obey the commandments. And I'll be like, well, is that what the Bible says? And see, this is really important what I'm saying right now because keeping that person engaged this is one of the reasons why, you know, there's a lot of churches out there, their heart's in the right place, they're preaching the right gospel, but they're thinking people are getting saved and they're not. Because they blow through the scriptures and they're not engaging the person in conversation and they're not doing a very thorough job of making sure that this person understands what the gospel is and understands what they need to believe in order to be saved. This is critical. So you ask the person, what do you, th you know, what do you think? What do we have to do? What does the Bible say we have to do to be saved? If they're listening and paying attention, you know, and, and right with you, they'll say, well, it says we have to believe on Jesus, right? And if they don't say that, be like, well, look, let's look at it again and make them read. I'll make them read it. What does the Bible say? Look, read this for me because you have your Bible with you. Believe on the Lord. So what do we have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make sure they get that. And I'll say, well, does that say we have to believe on Christ and go to church every week? No. Does that mean we have to believe on Christ and, you know, pray every day? No. It just says to believe. And then, depending on, on how well a person receives that, is how many more verses I'll show them about that matter. And it's important to show them more than just one verse, especially on what do I have to do to be saved? Now, I, could have, I should have probably listed more than just the two that I listed here, John 3.16. 
Everybody has heard this before, pretty much. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, you know, I like to show people, look, here's the question and answer, but this isn't the only place in the Bible that it says this. It says it all throughout the Bible. And you show them John 3, 16, very clear, whosoever is anybody, whosoever believeth in Him, right? Again, no mention of works, no mention of being a good person. John 3, 18, he that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In John 3.36 also, um, th those are three verses you could show in succession because they're all right there. John 3.18 I like a lot because then I'll explain, hey, there's two types of people in this world. The Bible says, he that believeth on him is not condemned. So they're not condemned. The person that believes they're not condemned. The person that doesn't believe, it says they're condemned already. Because, why? Because they didn't believe. Very clear, very, very um, straightforward. And, and it's really important to break it down to be super simple for people to understand that this is what determines our salvation. Belief on Christ or not belief on Christ. And then, once I feel like I've thoroughly exhausted the, the you know, believing is the requirement, pretty much the last thing that needs to be explained and make sure is understood is that salvation is a free gift from no, of no works and you receive it one time and it lasts forever, that it truly is eternal life. And one of the ways I do this is by explaining, look, the words that, that the Bible uses in regards to salvation are everlasting and eternal. It's everlasting life. It's eternal life. Is there anything that I need to know about that conversation right now? Okay, thank you. And by definition, those words mean forever. And a way I'll explain this to people is they, look, this is, forever means forever. Right? Would God lie? If God said something's going to last forever, will it last forever? Can we trust Him? Can we, can we believe that this is truly going to last forever? And, um, you know, obviously the answer is yes, we can. But I also like to show even more verse, besides that's, that's part of an argument from logic, just saying, okay, this is the definition of the word, this is what it means. Um, can we believe that? Yes. But John 5, 24 is probably my favorite verse to show people um, on eternal security. 5, 24, so John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So there we see you have everlasting life. You don't get it later after you die. You have it. And not just that, he, prom he makes another promise. He says, not only do you have everlasting life, you shall not come into condemnation. It's not going to happen. And notice he doesn't say, unless you kill somebody or unless you stop going to church or anything like that. He says, you shall not come into condemnation, but you've passed from death unto life. It's that one-time event. You were headed towards death and hell as a sinner and, and not having your faith in Christ. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you've passed over. Now um, you're, you're, you're saved. And when the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it shows you that we're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. If it were based on our works or with the things that we did, how good we were, then we couldn't know for sure if we're saved. But because it's everlasting, because it's a free gift, because it's given to us for free um, one time, we could know that we're saved. And um, the examples that I like to use, and I don't know if I have this on here or not. I don't. I'll have to add that. The examples that I like to use specifically with people, there's two illustrations that I'll give. One of them is the free gift and just really go into detail about the free gift because I'll be honest with you, sometimes you, know, you could go through a lot of this stuff and people still don't quite get it. They don't grasp the freeness of salvation, of, of the, that free gift. So one way, especially with, with younger kids and children, they love getting gifts. And a gift is something that should keep their attention. Yeah, do you like getting gifts? I like getting gifts too. Why do you like getting gifts? Oh, you get something for free, right? When it's your birthday, do you have to go pay everybody that, that brought a present for you? Of course not. 
You just get all these gifts. You didn't have them the day before, then all of a sudden you have all these things. Why do people give you gifts? Because they love you. They want you to have something nice. Well, God loves you and He wants you to have a gift. And He bought it. He paid for it. It's already done. It's already paid for. It's purchased. It was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ and He wants you to have it. And I'll give you an example. Now, if I wanted to give you this Bible as a gift, I said, here you go. This is yours. All you got to do is take it. If you don't take it, is that gift yours still? No. I mean, you have to take it in order to, for it to be yours, right? In order for you to have this gift, you have to physically take it. Once you take it, though, it belongs to you. And, I, you know, I go through all these, these explanations of a free gift. And um, you don't have to pay for it. It's yours. Once I give it to you, it's yours. I can't come back later and take it away from you and say, you know, give me that back. Or, you know, I don't like what you were saying about me. I'm taking this, this gift back from you. Then I would be a thief. I'd be stealing it. And just explain how God's gift is eternal life. It's eternal. He already said it's eternal. It lasts forever. And um, you only have to receive a gift that lasts forever one time. The other illustration I like to use is, is being born again. And this tends to hit home a lot with people, especially mothers. People who have children. It's a, it's a great concept to get because you can get people to understand this that you know, I'll show them um, John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's um, John chapter 3 right in the very beginning, like verse 4, I think. I don't know the exact reference. Verse 3. Excuse me. Verse number 3. And um, John chapter 1 explains, but as many as received him, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. That's how we're born again. When we believe on Jesus Christ, we become his children. We become a child of God. We become a son or a daughter. And once you have a child, I mean, you only have one birthday, right? My children only have one birthday. They don't have multiple birthdays. It's not like they could be born and then unborn and then born again and then unborn and born again. No. The reason why it's called born again, it's because it's talking about our spirit being born. Right? Physically, we're already born. We need a second birth. It's a spiritual birth. But that spiritual birth happens one time. It's not a, a birth that takes place over and over and over again. It happens once. And especially parents can understand this. You say, okay, your children, right? they, have, they have one birthday. They were born one time. I'm sure you have rules for them or you had rules for them when they were growing up, right? Why do you have rules for them? Because you hate them and you don't want them to have any fun? No. Because you love them. You want them to grow up right. You want them to do the right thing. They need to understand there's consequences for their actions. Was your child just perfect and never broke the rules? No. Of course not. No child is. Every child makes a mistake. They all break the rules and they all need disciplining. Right? But would you ever take your child and for punishment throw them in the oven and turn it on broil and leave them in there forever? No. No parent would do that. I mean, no, no sane parent would do that, right? Um, no normal person that you talk to is going to say yes to that question. Of course not. Why wouldn't you do it? Because you love them. Because doing that is going to destroy them and kill them and you're not going to um, show, you know, they're not going to learn from it and grow. So, you know, you give them a spanking, hey, that's teaching them not to do that again in the future. That is a final judgment punishment of throwing them into that oven. When you become God's child, does that mean you're just going to be perfect and obey all of God's laws? No. You're still imperfect. We still have this flesh. But He will love us the same way that you would love your children, no matter what they do. You'll always love them. And you may be upset with them. You may be angry at times. You may have to discipline them. But you always love them. And they're always your children. You cannot change that fact. And, and really stress this with people so that they understand, hey, I am, you know, when you put your faith in Christ, you've become a child of God. You're in His family. Nothing can change that fact. This, both of those examples do a really good job of getting people to understand the concept of salvation. Because if you don't know what you're believing in, you can't believe in it. Like, if you don't understand the gospel, you can't believe the gospel. Does that make sense? I mean, if you think it's something else, 
if you think it's, you know, for some people think the gospel is faith plus works, or if you think you can lose it because I've done something wrong, you don't believe the right gospel. You're not believing the right thing. You've never had your faith in the right place to begin with. And that's what we want to be extremely careful to do is make sure a person understands that. So now we get to point seven, which is to, you know, we've gone through all of the, all, you've gone through all the main points by this point. You've explained who Jesus was. You explained that they're a sinner. You explained that they deserve hell. And you explain what they have to do to be saved is to believe. And that once you do that, you're saved forever. Good. Now, just make sure you didn't skip anything or go over it too fast. Recap those main points with, with the person and, and ask if they believe um, what you're saying, what, what they're showing them, what the Bible says here. Do they believe that? And one really good way when, you're, when you think you're all said and done and you've, you've explained everything, a really good way to understand whether or not a person believes, and this could be used at any time for anybody, when you want to get at the heart of, of a person to see what are they truly trusting in, give them an example that is like a very extreme example. The example I like to use, and, and I'll just summarize it here. I wrote it all down for you. I just give an example of a person. I say, okay, let's say you've got a 20-year-old guy. They hear about Jesus Christ. They, they hear about what he did for him and died on the cross. And they decide... I'm going to put my faith in Christ. I believe in Jesus. And God sees that person's heart. Now, according to the Bible, everything we just read, is that person saved? So I like to ask that very first question. Okay, a 20-year-old man, he hears about Jesus. God sees his heart. He puts his faith on Jesus. Is that person saved? They should say yes at this point. If you've been thorough enough, they should say yes, of course. Why are they saved? Well, because they believed in Jesus. Okay, good. Same person though, 10 years later, they're 30 years old. They start drinking and start doing drugs and they, their habit gets worse. And then they start stealing because they, they don't have any money. They need to start stealing to support their habit. And one day when they're doing a robbery, they kill somebody. They murder them. And you know what? They're in such a bad state, they're not even sorry about it. They just killed that person and took their money and then they go home and they overdose on drugs or they kill themselves or whatever. You know, I mean, it's, it's an extreme example. I say, where do you think that person's going? Do you think that person went to heaven or hell? That will tell you what a person believes. And then I'll ask them why. So whatever they answer, if they answer right or wrong, I ask them why. Say, if they say, well, that person, went, that person believed, right? Yes. Well, they went to heaven. So why, why would they go to heaven? Because they believed in Christ. And that's when you could feel pretty confident that, okay, this person understands the gospel. But if they say, well, no, that person would go to hell, I'll say, okay, well, why? Why would they go to hell? I'll say, well, I mean, he, he killed somebody or he took his own life or, you know, like, I mean, he, he wasn't even sorry about it. He didn't even, he didn't repent. He didn't, you know, he didn't change. Then I'll say, okay, well, what does the Bible say we have to do to be saved? What do we have to do? And hopefully they'll say, believe. Did that person believe? Yeah, they did, but, you know, and that's where you go with that. And, and these are the examples you need to use to explain that because sometimes it can be a hard concept to grasp because it's still, what it is, is it's still... This, this relying on being a good person to be saved. You can't, I mean, you can't kill somebody and go to heaven. You can. You can. Because it's not based on your works. Now, should we go out and kill people? No. Is that what I do? I believe this way. Does that mean I'm just going to go out and start murdering people? No, of course not. Of course not. But if I did, just hypothetically, just if, if I were to do that, would I still go to heaven? Yes, because Jesus has already saved me. He saved my soul. He's given me the gift of eternal life. He's not going to take it back. It's forever. It's eternal. And I trust God's promise is true. And that's, you know, so then once you've, get, once you've gotten through all of that and a person is, is understanding and believing the gospel, the last thing that I do is we'll lead them in prayer and say, okay, 
You've heard the God, you know, you've, you've heard all the stuff from the Bible, you've seen it for yourself. Before we leave, I want to pray with you. And we'll ju- all we're going to do is, is you're going to tell God that your faith is in Him, and, and I can word it for you to help you out with what to say, but you just repeat this after me and um, only say the things if you believe it in your heart. And sometimes I'll show them Romans 10 to explain why we do the, um, the prayer. Because people might want to know. And it's very biblical. It's very scriptural. I preached an entire sermon about this. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in verse 13 it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you say, this is all we're doing right now. We're, you're calling upon God. You're calling upon Jesus to save you. And I gave a sample prayer here. Um, very common for what I use. Just, just, dear Jesus, I know I've sinned. I know I deserve hell. And in this prayer, if you'll notice too, I mean, use whatever prayer you want. Again, this isn't something you have to do. But in the prayer, I'm also doing another little bit of a recap of all the main points just to make sure I didn't forget something. Just to make sure that maybe something that they agreed to earlier, now when we're actually praying to God and they're paying attention to it, because I've had this happen not very often, but a couple times, someone was like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't deserve help. So I'll say, so I'll say in the prayer, the sample prayer I use is just, you know, dear Jesus, I know I've sinned and I know I deserve hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead to pay for my sins. Please save me. I'm only trusting in, in Jesus for my salvation. Something, I mean, something that, along those lines. That's what I'll say. And, and, you know, when people are praying to God, typically they'll take it seriously. So if you've missed something, if you didn't go over something enough, hopefully at least by this point that'll come up again. Um, if you've been real thorough and they were paying attention and, you know, and everything else, then it should be good. But, um, but that's it. And, and I know I kind of spent a lot of time going through this, but this is really important. Um, and that's why I have it all printed out because it's a lot to take in at one time. But you can go through this. Now let's go over some of the tips that I have and then we'll just do some, some practicing, okay? And with the practicing, even if you, I mean, you could have these things with you. You could fold it up and put it in your Bible. There's no rules about like what you can and can't do. Don't worry about looking like, oh, I, might, I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm doing or anything. Who cares? And this is the thing about giving the gospel is it's not about you at all. Don't worry about how you're going to look in front of people because that's not why you're out doing it anyways. People will make fun of you. It doesn't matter. The first time I gave the gospel to someone, the first time I got someone saved, I dropped my Bible on the floor and just totally looked like an idiot and, and was nervous and everything else. But you know what? The kid got saved. Do you know why? Because it wasn't based on my power and my experience or my skill or anything like that. It's based on God's word. So whatever you need to do to help you along the way, use it. And that's why I give you some of these tips and that's why I printed this out so you guys can take it home, stick it in your Bibles, keep it as a reference to help you to, I mean, ultimately you want to get to the point to where you have Bible verses memorized, you've been doing this enough, you're comfortable and, and, and you know, you're able to talk to people a lot easier. But nobody starts off that way, nobody. It takes years and years of practice and going out on a regular basis to get to that point to where it comes pretty natural to you. So use these tips. Obviously, the first one, I'm going to reiterate this. You have to use Bible verses. You have to. Very critical. Number one important thing, use the Bible verses. Number two, try to stay focused on the gospel. Especially, it's even more common with people that you know because you're comfortable with them, you're having a conversation, you know, you start talking about and then people say, well, what do you think about aliens? What, what does the Bible say about that? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And, you know, if you want to answer those questions, fine, but do it later. Be like, hey, I'd love to talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but let me, let me get through this. I, want to show, I just want to show you this part real quick first because this is more important than that. Or whatever. I mean, however it needs. Just try to stay focused on, on the gospel itself. Um, three, I, I mentioned that before. Engage in the conversation. Don't just preach it. Don't be like, because I mean, we're not doing, it's not like a, a sales pitch, right? Where you're just like, read through everything, 
and then okay do you believe that all right cool you're saved bye you know like that is not what we're doing at all um, again the, the more comfortable you get with this the better you'll be at engaging in conversation it's better to at least explain and preach the verses to people than to not but try to remember to, to, to keep that person involved and, and, and keep yourself calm. I mean, it's typically it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation you're having. It's not like you have to stand in front of a whole group of people and, and do this. You're talking to someone. Remember, it's a conversation. Um, number four, use examples. It'll, people need to hear these, like I, like I gave the free gift or being born again. This helps drive home a concept and helps people understand it is by using those types of examples. Um, <coughs> number five, stress eternal security. Spend a lot of time on that. Eternal security is inherent to salvation. If you could lose it for any reason, then you're not trusting in faith alone. You're trusting in work somehow. Um, verse number, or tip number six, highlight the verses in your Bible. I saw you were just doing that. When we have the verses, I have the verses highlighted in my Bible. I do. Now, is it because I need to have them highlighted? Uh, no. Um, some I, I do because there's a few verses that I don't have the exact reference just memorized in my head. I know where they're at. I know what book of the Bible they're in. But when I see the highlight, it's like, oh, boom, it's right there. It also makes it easier for the person you're showing it to to read the Bible because I like to show the Bible to someone. So when you have, uh, um, like in Romans, it's easy to see, like, this is where I'm talking about. This is where we're reading from. And now that I have it quoted, I can quote it while they're looking at it and reading it on the page and it's highlighted for them, for their eyes to, to focus right on that. Um, the last tip I have on this sheet <coughs> is, especially if you're new at this, you can write the references down. So as long as you pick out whatever verse you want to start with, if you're doing it the way that I do it, I always start with Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What you can do is as long as you could remember Romans 3.23 or keep a bookmarker there or keep your little, you know, your, your Bible marker page, whatever, always at that spot, then on Romans 3.23, you could take your pen and write Romans 6.23. And then you can go to Romans 6.23. And then you could write on Romans 6.23, Revelation 20, 14, and 15. And then you could go there, you know, you know what I'm saying? And it'll, it'll guide you through your own Bible. That is also a helpful tip or technique that you can use. So, lots of stuff to digest today. Um, it, it, there's just there's so much. This is the basic outline. Now, once you have this down, um, it's a matter of just repetition and practice. So, that's it for my, my preaching and teaching part of, of this. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time, however long you guys want to stay, um, going over just doing some practices practice conversation now the first conversation we're going to do is going to be <coughs> from the whoever your partner like like for us for you and me i'm going to we're going to partner up let the ladies do the talking and do the soul winning part and we're going to be very easy very little questions just agreeing just just going along with the whole thing okay just, just being that very, very good listener and, and very receptive, okay? Um, we'll do that at least a, a few times. And then, um, and then you can start giving a little bit more difficult questions or just, I mean, just asking questions, right? Just saying, well, what, you know, like, so that can get them to explain it better.